Hello, everyone, and welcome. I hope that you're enjoying day two so far. It is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker today. Next up, we have Timothy Persons, and he is the Chief Scientist and Managing Director of Science, Technology, Assessment, and Analytics at Government Accountability Office. And his talk today is entitled, Could AI Help Streamline the Drug Development Process? Please welcome Timothy to our virtual stage. Timothy, you can turn on your camera and join us here. Okay, hello everyone, I'm Tim Persons. Thank you so much for uh, the organizers and for having me here for this talk, I appreciate the time. Uh, we have a lot to talk about today, not a lot of time, so uh, I just wanted to start out with a little fun poll. Let me submit something. Uh, we're going to be talking about AI and drug discovery. It's a particular part of the healthcare system that's very important, as you all know right now, but let's just talk about AI in our everyday lives. So uh, the key poll is, what AI do you have in your life right now? Uh, you might uh, have a voice assistant. You might use tax prep software, shopping advisor. Uh, you might have speech to text uh, type capability like on Word or on uh, Dragon, naturally speaking, and so on. But uh, what do you have? Okay, so let me submit mine. Okay, so we're getting a lot of all the above. I think a lot of folks are in with the um, uh, voice assistant. If you have Google Assist or Siri or um, Alexa on the uh, Amazon systems, then you'll uh, be aware of that. So I see a lot of, and there's still some of the none of the above. That's totally fine. So I'm going to share my screen and we're going to just go over some slides and, and okay. Um, and let's get into why this everyday life experience that we have matters uh, even for the, the drug discovery process. So just very briefly, GAO uh, as an organization is the organization supporting the US Congress. We, are, we stand for the Government Accountability Office. We're about a century old uh, next year. Uh, but uh, my job is also to not only support Congress in science and technology on uh, oversight questions, but also to provide insight on uh, technology developments and the foresight or directions, the policy implications of them. And so I'm proud to uh, be able to talk about some work that we've done on AI and the drug dis development uh, process. And we did this in partnership with the National Academy of Medicine I'll be describing throughout. But let's just look at what AI is. I, I really uh, like the DARPA, that's the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency's um, uh, system where they, they uh, classify things into first, second, and third wave of uh, the science. Uh, for the purposes of the talk, I'm just defining AI as what's to the right, but I don't want to get into quibbles about definitional issues on AI. I know that's, that's very elusive at times. So I really just want to focus functionally on what AI has been doing. And the reason I mentioned, for example, tax preparation in the opening poll is because we really have been in a first wave environment where you're talking about expert knowledge or criteria, logical reasoning, where the rules are all set up front. So uh, things are just hard coded in. And as long as you follow the system, just like when I get interviewed, as it were, by my software every year, as I'm inputting data into it, I input my income, I input my deductions, et cetera, then I'm really dealing with a system. The rules are set up and the software is just doing me a favor of helping me navigate the expansive and detailed IRS uh, rules on tax submission and so on and compliance. So there's high reasoning from a logical perspective, a little bit of perceiving, but essentially no learning or abstracting on that. So we've been in the first wave for a while. We've kind of checked that box. It's changed our lives, I think, for the better. I would note, by the way, in the first wave, the online tax prep or the software packages have not eliminated the need for CPAs. I think that's important because uh, one of the big scare uh, things that I often get asked about is whether or not we're going to have a job apocalypse because of AI. The short answer is no. 
Uh, it's just going to be for certain jobs. There will be losses of things, but it will also uh, change the nature of work and help us do and hopefully be uh, better versions of ourselves and whatever we're doing at higher learning, knowledge and wisdom functionalities. So let's talk about the second wave, machine statistical learning. The jump from first to second is huge because you really are moving from a deterministic type system into a statistical and statistics gets messy. It has uncertainty. Uh, you're dealing with large data sets, heterogeneous data sets. You have to ha have the system learn and get better by doing more of it. So early versions of systems are uh, more error prone or sloppy or they'll do things that surprise us. But that's in the realm we are now. Uh, if we are the, at the you are here kind of mall map, this is the second wave. We're in the midst of it. It informs the voice recognition technology uh, I talked about the opening poll. Also the face recognition technology things. That's a very uh, t hot topic right now in uh, Washington DC with the Congress uh, for various reasons. We want that to be right. We want that to be equitable. We want it to be safe and secure, et cetera. But uh, from a technology AI perspective, you're really talking about systems with large data sets that have large perceiving and learning and starting to increase in the abstracting and reasoning scale. And then now, lastly, the third wave moving over, this is where you have a system that knows what it needs to do in advance. This is where it's really much more in the intelligence domain. It understands context and things. And the reason we have just a ship there is because the easy example is the way DARPA is pursuing autonomous ships. So if you can imagine the future US Navy not having any sailors on board the ship whatsoever, and the ship knows what to do in terms of maneuvering or operating one way in a state of war versus operating a different way in uh, a humanitarian crisis, both of which the U.S. Navy supports in various ways, but operates very differently. That's where you want a ship to just understand what it needs to do in its environment based upon little input and have, as you see down below, high perceiving, learning, abstracting, and reasoning. So that's, uh, I think, uh, an elegant way of, of talking about this. So what is the problem? This is really the, the picture of the drug discovery development and approval process. And I think uh, I don't need to convince you all that this is a critical time uh, for this to, uh, for, for what we're facing uh, in the world in terms of dealing with COVID-19 and trying to discover both therapeutics that are drugs that will treat patients uh, to save lives, mitigate pain and so on uh, brought about by uh, COVID as well as uh, come up with a vaccine. And so really you look at the, the process there at the top bar, it's 10 to 15 years. You're talking about a decade to a decade and a half. That of course is not acceptable from the perspective of the crisis that we're now in. And so there are a number of things pushing through this, but this is an important baseline just to lay out and say, here's what it looks like, uh, the process from the left side on drug discovery, where you have drug functionals, uh, the uh, recent estimate I heard was 10 to the 80 power. So that's a one if for those of you who have large whiteboards in your office, you can write a one with 80 zeros after it. And that's, a, that's what we're talking about, the search space of all the functionals and drug discovery that have to be done. That is clearly a thing that you want a machine to help you with. Then you wanna move that into uh, mouse trials, the laboratory testing, you have to get the science right. And so this is where you really care about the safety and you wanna narrow down from this huge amount of, of potential lock and key fits is the way they, they think about it. In other words, like an old key into a lock to be able to open something is finding that functional that does what you need it to do, whether it's trying to cure cancer or a type of cancer or Alzheimer's or uh, to deal with uh, the SARS-2 virus. So in this case, uh, this is where a lot of uh, laboratory science comes in. AI has a role in this as well to try and reduce the search space improve the uh, clinical uh, lab or the laboratory outcomes, because then we're talking about moving from an animal model into people. And this is where it's the phase one, two, three of clinical trials. And this is where you're talking about increasing numbers. Uh, the ideal vaccine in this case or therapeutic, it, it can't just work for only women and not men or only uh, white folks and not uh, Hispanics. Uh, you want it to work for the young and the old. You want it to have uh, very minimal, if any, side effects. So this is why you have this structure and this phased approach to just test, in this case, dozens initially, 
uh, into uh, which usually is a shorter time period, but then phase two is really uh, getting into uh, a dozen more than uh, the 20 to 80, you're talking hundreds typically, and then phase three into the up to thousands. And there are, by the way, just as a, a bookmark here, there are a number of key vaccines in phase three, but you just cannot shortcut the science. And what we want AI to do in this case is try and reduce the time span, moving from the left to the right, all the way through so that the regulator, in this case, the US Food and Drug Administration, is able to look at this. And so uh, over here, we say approximately one in 10 compounds that enter, that means cross this boundary here, uh, only 10% receive approval. Uh, but I also heard from a, um, a recent uh, drug representative, a consortium that said, look, the batting average, the whole process is at best one in 20. So only 5% we really do have to increase our batting average as, as it were. And AI has a key role in terms of doing that, both in the search space on the laboratory side and de-risking things through the human trials so that you have a very minimal human um, uh, intervention, but you, you move things forward. AI in general is in, like any disruptive technology, is an opportunities and challenges narrative. You want to improve, you want AI to improve productivity and economic outcomes. That's true for healthcare. You want better service. Uh, a lot of errors often happen or med bad medical outcomes come because of just uh, errors and we need to have AI help solve that problem. Uh, but also just in general, AI to improve security, reduce crime, uh, enhance mobility, all these key things that we've looked at in AI in general. The challenges are, of course, is you want uh, the AI algorithm to be fair. You don't want it to be biased. You want it to be constitutionally clean uh, so that it's compliant with the Civil Rights Act of 1964, for example. You also want to preserve constitutional civil liberties uh, and privacy, but yet you want it to be transparent and accountable. You want it to have key safety and oversight. And again, medical is like that as well. AI is now being used to confirm medical ingestion. And this is an example that I like. Uh, this is called AI Cure. It was a small business innovation research project funded out of the NIH. And it's just a application to remind folks to take their medicines. And so the AI is helpful in just uh, doing a reminder. Uh, on a personal note, I have a friend who became a uh, pathologist and uh, one of the reasons that he specializes in that instead of doing something in like the ER is because when he did his internship at ER, he was depressed to see the same people come into the ER over and over again who simply were there because they weren't taking their medicine. So we could have huge savings and, and medical burden, disease burden would drop just by having a reminder of that. And so it's helpful now that we have phones, smartphones in our hands and have uh, technology that could help do that. And AI is doing that. Of course, now uh, tracking disease outbreaks, we're all familiar with the maps or the Johns Hopkins data that presents all the uh, disease um, prevalence, uh, how it's spreading, at what rate, uh, and where the deaths are, where the cases are, et cetera. And so AI is also uh, important in terms of collecting, uh, amalgamating all of that data and being able to help, but really has been one of the weakest points of our public health care system uh, is the disease surveillance. It's just getting the data early, getting reliable data, understanding or seeing pictures of things emerging, let's say, in some country overseas before it comes to the U.S. And now that it's here, of course, we have a lot of things to do uh, disease tracking with. Uh, one of the things we recently did was contact tracing apps. That's a new uh, emergent technology being used in several states. And I put a, a report or a note uh, on that in the chat box right before the event. So you're welcome to look at the contact tracing. And then just at the top line is the whole mention of our joint study with National Academy of Medicine AI. So you all can look at that. But again, AI is being used now to help do this now. It's very critical. Looking across the rest of the federal government, we really are talking about uh, in Veterans Administration is matching veterans with clinical trials for experimental therapeutics. One of the pain points of VA has been their ability to effectively and efficiently deliver care to our veterans. We owe that to them. Uh, and uh, that's, a, that's a critical problem that uh, AI is helping to do now on that. And VA is also exciting because their data sets on patients, they have to keep for eight decades. 
So you really are talking about nearly a century of data. That's a that's a kid in a candy store kind of moment for chief data officers. If you had data sets with that longitudinality, what you could do with that and the medical discoveries are the things that are just unimaginable to, to imagine what, what's going on. So there's a lot of excitement about what's going to come out of VA in terms of helping solve a lot of our problems and do right by our veterans. Uh, NIH uh, is using text analytics in terms of its pub PubMed. Uh, it has 2.3 million daily users. Uh, that was probably a number before COVID came upon it. So you can imagine how many publications now are flying around and going in and trying to make sense of all the science going in. Science has been pretty messy on COVID in terms of just getting uh, understanding of what's going on as, as the science continues to emerge. So AI can help with that. I mentioned the DOD and DOT sandboxes. I'll just talk about the DOT one. Uh, that's just important because we really do have autonomous vehicles out there and companies uh, using that technology, but you want to use it safely. And so you need a place to be able to test the technology in a real world environment and do things like you know, roll a, a trash can in front of it suddenly when it's coming down the road to see how does it respond to that or how does it look like when you have a cat or a dog run in front or simulate things. Uh, it's very important to move from the uh, what when I met with the uh, Undersecretary of Transportation, he was saying recently it was you got to move from uh, uh, thousands of miles to millions and million to hundreds of millions of miles of testing. And that can only be done in a sandbox. That's the amount of work that it takes before we are going to deploy things safely in that domain. But closer to home, we have uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology doing a lot of great work on AI. They're critical for standards, and I'll talk about that. I mentioned some things at NIH, and then FDA is the regulator itself, has to and is evolving rapidly to learn how to deal with algorithms, because normally when an FDA has seen things in a medical device, it's it's that is the medical device, the way it's been submitted. But in an algorithmic sense, you're always going to have uh, FDA uh, needing to look at things at out in an algorithmic way. And then lastly, I'll just say, I mentioned our NAM partnership. We're proud to be doing three studies with them. One's already been released, the one I'm talking about today. But we also have one we're doing on AI for medical services, as well as AI for diagnostic testing and things. We do also do at GAO our own sandbox. We have an innovation lab because we want to explore robotic process automation for business um, improvements. We also want to see what machine learning systems uh, do and how to hold them accountable. And so I'll talk about that at my last slide. But here on our AI for Drug Discovery Report, we really came up with policy options. It's our job to present these to our members who asked for this work. And so for them, we uh, this is what came out of our study. We said, look, you can do more research and you're certainly going to increase, I think, this science and tech output, generate a lot of data. The main thing is that the research is never certain in terms of what it does. It's just important to have it there. Uh, but you also, at, at times, research is also a zero-sum game. What thing would you cut in order to fund new work in AI uh, and data? And that's uh, where a lot of the friction happens at DC. Also in policy options are access to data. Uh, this is, we're in an era where you'll hear CDOs say data are the new oil. Uh, that's not wrong. Uh, so there's huge amounts of, uh, of, of there there in terms of having data shared and being able to um, uh, identify uh, unsuccessful drug candidates sooner in our case using machines. But the challenge is sharing is easy to say but hard to do. There's legal consequences to that. You don't want to have the risk of de-identification if you're talking about patient or clinical data. You worry about the hackers and cybersecurity. That's the era we're in. And uh, you could just have cultural issues or intellectual property issues to navigate. So this is one, a very challenging issue that policymakers would need to weigh in on what does data access mean and how do we make that happen. Then there's standardization, which is uh, usually considered one of the most boring issues in principle because nobody really likes to talk about standards and yet it's critical for interoperability, for having transparency in systems, for really the innovation system. And NIST and others in our government have a key role in this. Uh, and I think for drug discovery development, obviously uh, standards are not just for the government itself or FDA, for example, it would also involve other uh, pharmaceutical companies and so on as it should. And so you have to really convene and get folks together, talk about these issues. It's going to be time and labor intensive, but it's worth it in the long run because uh, like we've experienced in the COVID science evolution is everybody's run in sort of different directions. We haven't had a good framework around a lot of the COVID science that we need in order to solve the problem in, in the large system sense that it is. 
Then you talk about human capital, and that's a big deal because this is really a transformation of the workforce. Again, as I said, it's not going to be job apocalypse. There are opportunities to upskill workers, and certainly we need to rethink our educational system in terms of how we train for the future of AI-enabled whatever, right? It, in this case, it could be doctors and nurses and clinical caregivers, public health officials. Uh, they need to still be themselves in terms of their uh, health work, but... Uh, we need to think about AI as an augmentation to their intelligence, as a tool to help them to work, which means it's interdisciplinarity, and uh, we need to think in that in that way. Uh, the considerations are that, of course, the federal government has put a lot of money into STEM, uh, and anyone who's tried to hire very good data science people knows that it's hard. To, uh, good help's hard to find, and it can be costly at times. And it's time and resources again. Then there's regulatory certainty. That's always a critical issue. You need to have rulemaking, public resource. You need to be able to have drug companies better leverage technologies, but you also need to have again a lot of that coordination and new rules. Uh, would mean review times might Im increase for the near term, even though you would want them to dial down in the longer term. Status quo just means if we did nothing, we can kind of muddle through. And so here we're just going to muddle through our, our, our problems in this way. Companies are using some AI things, but there's, it's not necessarily coordinated. So you might imagine having a better system where you have pre-competitive research and standards making process that works for everybody. And then uh, the, the pharmaceutical companies operate on the functionals and, and certain things. That's, that's where they would have their IP or secret sauce for their issues. But the consideration is that really all these things described would be, would be uh, not dealt with. So in my remaining time, I just wanna close here and then go to questions is that we at GAO really, A is our middle, accountability is our middle name and we're increasingly being called upon to do oversight on these systems. So we would be the ones that, and do routinely uh, do oversight or audit, for example, the FDA. So if we were to go in and audit an FDA uh, algorithmic system, how would we know that we have assurance on that? And so that's why at GAO, we're taking a leadership uh, campaign and uh, bringing together a lot of uh, cross-sectoral experts to develop a first-of-its-kind framework for accountability and transparency for AI. It's critical for us because we just have to do this. Uh, I used to think that we would need it in the near future, but uh, meaning uh, our congressional clients would be asking for it in the not-too-distant future, but I'm too late. I've already had those phone calls where they've asked me to do oversight work now, and in the absence of a framework, we just haven't we just haven't been able to do it. So we've got to fix that problem. But I think, in a bigger sense, we're all in the same boat. Uh, we want our cars to be accountable and safe. We want anything that deals with a legal system or identification or cybersecurity or whatever using a uh, certainly in medical care. We want to have accountability and transparency. So we think a lot of this framework that we put out, uh, we're having a meeting this fall, but we'll put out quarter of next year, uh, the final product, we think there's a lot of work uh, there to, to have an evolutionary framework that will have continuing uh, input from a variety of stakeholders. So I appreciate your time. Let me just stop sharing my window and then I'm going to go to the chat box and see what we have in terms of uh, Q&A that may have uh, come in for this. So let me just pause any questions in our remaining time that I have uh, on this talk. Thank you all. And thanks, Ryan, for uh, uh, compliments on the references. Happy to have provided that. They're free resources uh, that anybody can, can access and take home. So questions in the chat box. OK, thanks, Adam. I appreciate that. Um, while questions may be coming in, let me just say that again, I think we're, AI is really, um, I, I like to call it, or it, it is called a general purpose technology that, um, and thanks Sophie, um, a general purpose technology is one that becomes so uh, prevalent and so um, immersive in our lives that it really disappears to us. So we no longer see it, um, just like it's not unusual for us to all have smartphones in our hands because they're everywhere. It used to be, that's a miracle to think about what, 
one of these smartphones it took to put them together and do that. So the same is true for electrification of homes. You know, the fact that we plug into an outlet and it just, you know, we just don't, we take uh, power outlets for granted. We just assume electrons are going to flow when we plug something in. So in the same way, AI is going to do that to us. So keep, keep uh, watching on that and thank you for your time. Thanks, RuPaul. Appreciate. Thanks to you. Appreciate that. All right, for anyone who's still here, there's extra time in case there's any other questions. Thank you, Madison. I appreciate it. Naama, thank you from LA. So great to have you with us. Okay, so Jared, thanks for your question. Best way to reach me uh, is uh, on the resources that I sent uh, or I listed in the chat box. Um, they do have my email address, so you're welcome to go ahead and um, send me an email if you need anything. Thank you, George. I appreciate your feedback on that. Glad you could join us as well. So Jared, let me just type in if you, anyone who needs to know, here's my GAO address. It's here and uh, folks are welcome to shoot me a note for any follow-up that they'd like to do. Okay, Adam, so the next five years, uh, researching uh, or research paper consuming models. Right, th that's a great question. So what, in terms of the research direction and the most promising, that is a really um, a powerful idea is essentially not only ingesting large data sets uh, of, of, of text and doing analytics on it uh, in the research papers, but also doing kind of like research gap analysis. Where is it not going on? And I've seen work where uh, you could do sense making word cloud clustering and things like that. Um, the Pacific Northwest National Lab had something I saw before where large ingest of data and they, they would create essentially what looks like uh, an astronomical constellation of things. And so when they have the huge constellation of the topics, you can kind of poke around. And I think where there might be something that's relatively modest in size or an, a cul-de-sac as it were, or a neighborhood of topics that are smaller that could give you uh, give direction for, well, you know what, we really don't know a lot about this part of the constellation of, of or the universe of this topic. And so there actually are powerful analytic tools, uh, emergent and emerging, uh, that uh, deal with this, uh, giving uh, insights, gaps, maybe even predictions saying, here's where the direction's going to go. So obviously vaccine development is super hot topic. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of, of work on that out there, but uh, great question. Thank you, Adam. Okay, we're down to the final seconds, but I'll say farewell and please stay in touch if you'd like to. So 